God is doing an incredible work this week, today, tomorrow, continually, so we are excited about all that God has coming our way. Um, last week, if you were here, Pastor Mike, which can we give it up for Pastor Mike? He did an incredible job last week. Come on. Kicking off our, our, our summer series called Tides, and, and the whole heart behind this series is that there is one thing that a lot of us like to think we like, but everyone in all reality doesn't like, and, but we experience it all the time, and that is change. <laughs> change is something that is inevitable in our life. It would be foolish to ask the question, who has experienced change? Because you've probably experienced it in the last 15, 20 minutes because someone took your parking spot or took your seat. <laughs> and I'm tempted to one Sunday let y'all walk in here and all the seats be rearranged and just really see how much all you people like change, right? <laughs> um, it might happen. Just watch out. Um, the idea is I get at 2 a.m. You never know what's going to happen on Sunday. Um, <laughs> But the idea of our heart behind this is not that change is going to happen. It's more preparing you for what changes you should expect and helping you understand how we deal with those changes. And so when we walk through this, because and this is what I find so funny about change, right? Is I readily admit that I don't like change. I can deal with it, but I don't like it if I don't choose it. <laughs> like this is the comical catch of change, right? If I decide something's gonna change, I'm okay with the change. And then I'm frustrated with you because you're not okay with the change. And then I sit and look at you like, what's wrong with this person? Why don't they just accept change? It's fine, change is good, right? <laughs> Although when you decide something's gonna change and you present the change, my thought is, what in the heck is wrong with this person? Why would they change that? Nothing's wrong with it. It's not broken. Why well, fix it? It's fine. Leave it. You know how I know you all struggle with change more than you're willing to admit? Because I'm a pastor at this church. <laughs> and we change things. And we hear whether you like it or not. We know. It's okay. We can be honest with ourselves this morning. It's a fun part of it. Change is going to happen. What change should we expect and how should we deal with it? Through this month, we're really going to look at three major types of change. One is we're going to look at the change you crave. What is the change you want to happen in your life? The change you're praying for, the change you're fighting for. Then we're going to look at the change you don't expect. Those moments when something happens that you weren't planning on it happening. Sometimes it's a, it's a good thing. Sometimes it's the unexpected raise. And now what do I do with the extra money? Sometimes it's the loss of a job, which feels bad, but then you find the job you're supposed to be in and it feels really good. And so you understand that change was actually good. Sometimes it's a surprise pregnancy, which ends up being a good change because you love your kids at the end of the day, but it's a surprise at first and you got to figure out how to take care of another life and how to pay for another life. And kids are expensive. <laughs> I thought I was expensive. I am, but kids are expensive. But how do we deal with the change that we don't expect, the change we don't see coming? And then lastly, what we're going to look at in the weeks to come is how do we receive the change we know we need but don't want to need? It's that the transformations that God calls us into, the things in our life that he's trying to pull us out of our comfort zone, out of our regular patterns in order to help us experience who he's called us to be. It's change we need, although we don't like to talk about it. But I'm going to start easy with you tonight. Today we're going to talk about the change you crave. We're going to start with the good stuff, the things that you want to happen in your life, the things that you desire to happen in your life. So what is the change you crave? Just, just think about it. Everybody's got something. Think about it, write it down, keep it in the forefront of your mind as we talk today. What is the change you crave? Is it, is it a relational change? That maybe there's, a, 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 there's something in your marriage that you want to see change, you want to see it increase, you want to see it grow and strengthen? Maybe it's a relationship with a friend or a family member or a child that you would love to see change. Maybe it's something with your finances. You're tired of feeling like you're stuck in this cycle of, of paycheck to paycheck living in debt. And there's a change you want to see happen in your income, in your finances. Maybe it's just the feeling of being stuck in a dead-end job. Maybe ever since you left your job and embraced retirement in Bradenton, Florida, now you're struggling to remember your purpose. And so that temptation of, well, I was this, but now what do I do? And you're looking for that purpose in life. For you teenagers, it's understanding how the world changes and you figure now, how am I supposed to be in this? What do I embrace? What do I not embrace? 
How do I increase my friendships? How do I have healthier friendships? What is the change you crave? When we think of things like change, we have at times what I call coffee cup verses. Like these are those Bible verses that are only encouraging, right? Like you don't see when Lot's wife turns to a pillar of salt on a coffee mug at, at Hobby Lobby, right? <laughs> like that, they don't, they don't publish that verse. Some of you are like, what? I know, okay? <laughs> that one's not stitched on pillows, okay? <laughs> but there are these, these, these coffee cup verses which are good, powerful, true verses. But, but my fear is that sometimes if we don't fully understand that verse, the truth of it can be a little misleading. So when I think of the desire to change, I immediately think of a verse like Psalm 37, 4. And the psalmist says this, he says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Anybody ever heard this verse? Anybody have this verse monogrammed on a pillow? <laughs> Come on, somebody. Like, this sounds great. And I believe in this verse. And so in my mind, I'm like, all right, God, let's talk desires. And I believe in God's power to create change. But then I look at my life and I think, I believe this verse. Take the light in the Lord. He will give you that your heart's desire. However, I'm still bald. I still don't have a six pack of abs. I still can't duck a basketball. And I still can't shoot under 80 on a golf course. <laughs> what the heck? Like, what happened to grant me the desires of my heart? I want hair. Like, let's go. Let's have a conversation. This is not by choice. Amen, brother. We feel me. We have these moments and we look at it and say, God, what's up? I thought this is what it said. But we have to understand and what we need to understand this morning is the, the truth of God working change in our life. The scripture is true. That scripture is not a promise, by the way. It's a lesson of truth. Some, some scripture is promise. Some scripture is lessons in truth. This is a lesson in truth that we apply, which means there's, there's, there's things we are a part of and responsibilities we have and then responsibilities God has in return. We have to understand the whole context of this verse and, and what it looks like for God to grant us the desire of our heart when we take delight in him. So we're going to do this. Every week, we're going to have a simple truth. And that simple truth, we're going to say annoyingly a hundred times in the message. And we're going to break it down. And the hope is that this simple truth will just get stuck in your heart. So that when it comes to facing the changes you crave, the changes you don't expect, and the changes you need but don't want to talk about, you can remember the simple truth that God speaks. So when it comes to the change you crave, this is our simple truth that we need to break down. The change you crave is a choice. Pursued through a partnership between you, God, and people. We'll say it again. The change you crave is a choice, first and foremost. And that choice is pursued in partnership between you, God, and people. We're going to break this down. And to help us understand this in the context of of truth, we're going to look at a, a man who experienced this. A man who demonstrated this desire to change and the partnerships required to see the change happen. When we first see him in the New Testament, we hear his name mentioned as Saul, but we all know him as Paul. Anybody ever heard of Paul in the New Testament? If you haven't heard of him, if you've read any of the New Testament, you've probably read something he wrote. Paul is responsible for writing over three-fourths of the New Testament. But understand who Paul was at first. At first, Paul really hated two things. Jesus and you. (laughs) Say, how do you hate me? He didn't know me. He hated anyone who believed in the name of Jesus. He was what was called a zealous Jew. His life's pursuit was was Jewish law and ritual above everything else. And, And the message of Jesus being the coming Messiah, having been the perfect son of God, died on the cross at the hand of the zealous Jews, and then rising, being risen from the grave, walking out alive, and then ascending back to heaven. Paul lived through this. He knew this. He watched this unfold from the other side of the aisle. And Paul's life was singular driven. His goal was simply to erase the spreading of the name of Jesus as the Messiah. 
In fact, the first time we see Paul mentioned is in Acts 7. The other thing we see in Acts 7 is the first Christian killed for his belief in Jesus. And what we see happen here is this man is stoned to death for preaching and teaching the message of Jesus Christ. And as he's stoned to death, those in the mob who kill him are taking his clothes off of his dead body and they lay them at the feet of Paul as a pain of tribute and honor because this man is leading the charge to eradicate the name of Jesus from the earth. So in Acts chapter 9, we see his story of change begin. In Acts chapter 9, it says that he has asked for and received an edict a, a law thing, a certificate of, of, of permission that would allow him to travel from town to town arresting any man and woman who speaks the name of Jesus as the Messiah. So you think anything that we face in our changing culture is difficult? You fear no arrest for speaking the name of Jesus. Amen. Yet they did. So as Paul is journeying to Damascus with his posse with him, with this legal permission to arrest any man or woman who speaks the name of Jesus, put them in chains, take them away from their home, put them in prison, and likely see them put to death, something happens. It says that on the road, all of a sudden he is surrounded and struck by this blinding light. His horse freaks out, he falls on the ground, and he hears a voice. And this voice cries out to him. It's in Acts chapter 9. This voice cries out, saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Which, side note, these are for free. Two awesome things in that verse. One, God knows you. Saul didn't know Jesus as the Messiah yet, but he knew Saul. Amen. He calls him by name. Not, hey, you, like so many of you call each other because we forget names. We're terrible at names. Anybody like that? I will remember a face from kindergarten. I will forget the name of someone I met 30 seconds ago. Like, uh, but Jesus knows him. And Jesus speaks to him. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The second thing I love about that is he says, me, not my people. Why is this important? Because as you are one with Jesus, you are one with Jesus. Amen. It says that when we know the Father, the Son, we know the Father, and we are connected to the Father like a grape to a vine. So when he says, why are you persecuting me? He's talking about the persecution of his people. This is how personal he takes an attack on his family, on you and I. He didn't say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my people? He says, no, 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 me and my people are one. Scripture says that when we suffer, we suffer in communion with the suffering Jesus faced, right? There, there's joy in this that we become a part of his journey and a part of his life. He says, why are you persecuting me? This is Paul's response, verse five. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. Understand, the Lord knows you before you know him. And a voice replied saying, I am Jesus which, another fun side note, I don't know how many times after Jesus ascends back to heaven that he speaks to people. We hear about it being God. We hear about it being the Holy Spirit. But here he says, I am Jesus. Not I am the messenger of God. Not, I am Jesus. Jesus, the one whose name you're persecuting, it's me. We're talking. I'm real and you hear me. He says, I am Jesus, the one who you are persecuting. Now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Then the men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Verse 8, Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. As he's there waiting in the city in which he was traveling to arrest anyone who spoke the name of Jesus, Jesus speaks to him, tells him to go to the city and to wait for a man. So then Jesus speaks to a man named Ananias and tells him, he says, Ananias, I need you to go to a house on Straight Street. 
there you will find a man named Saul. What I love is Ananias' response. He's like, hold on. <laughs> it's like, you ever hear a name and it's like, I feel like I know that name. <laughs> you see someone in the store and it's like, I feel like I know that person. Immediately, bless you. He, that's not, it's just a family. We got you. Immediately, Ananias hears this call. You're going to go to Damascus, a straight street. He knows where this is. You're going to find a man named Saul. He's waiting for you, and he's praying to me right now. That's huge. He says that Saul at that moment is praying to the Jesus he's persecuting, asking for help because he's heard his voice. He's already on this track of belief and change. He already made that choice to go to Damascus and wait in the home. Now Ananias makes a choice. He's like, you sure? I've heard of this guy. He's doing bad things to guys like me. Are you sure? He says, go, because he must know how he will suffer for my name. He must know the purpose I have for his life, the calling I have on him. So Ananias goes. In 17 and 18, we see what happens. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. The change you crave is a choice. Pursued through a partnership between you, God, and people. The first thing you have to understand, the first thing we see in Paul's story, the first thing we see back in Psalm 37 is that change starts with a choice. Change in your life starts with a choice. It will not happen unless you deem that you want it to happen. It will not take place unless you choose to chase after it on your own accord. This is the simplest step, yet the hardest step. Every New Year's resolution starts with a choice to go and stops when we don't go. <laughs> it starts by understanding our role in the change we desire. I heard this riddle the other day. A lot more people got in the first service than I thought. I'm clearly not as smart as they are, okay? So I'm going to walk you through it. It says that there were three frogs sitting on a log. One of them decided he wanted to get off the log. How many frogs are still on the log? Shush, Mike, you were in the first service, you cheater. <laughs> it is three. Why is it three? He decided he wanted to. It doesn't mean that he did it. I got mad at the internet the other day when I read that because I was wrong. I, I did not think I was wrong. It's technicality of the English language, all right? But that's why it's important. Because part of our responsibility and change is that we have to choose to start it and finish it. Otherwise... It's our own fault. If we want something to change in our marriage, we have to choose to start chasing that change and see it to its end. Amen. Amen. And the victory end is not a new spouse. The victory end is the hopefulness of a reconciled marriage, Amen. which I will speak very boldly to that very quickly. If you're praying for God to heal and save or change your marriage and you see someone new, that's not God's path. Amen. Amen. Let's be honest. It's not. So you choose to chase. Now, your spouse has to choose the same thing. But you are only in power of you and responsible for your decision. It starts with a choice. You have to choose to begin that. You have to choose to go. You have to choose to get up and do something about it. Does anybody have like, like thermostat rules in their house? Some of you? Some of you know what I'm talking about. We were talking about this this morning. It's hot, all right? Some of you northerners, you're still getting used to it not being, you're missing the snowbird season of your life when you go back up north before you melt, right? <laughs> For us, it, we have a very simple rule. I like to be cold. I want to walk around my house in a hoodie because it's comfortable. I, don't, I know the electric bill is expensive. I will pay the cost, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But that means we have a rule. If you are cold, do not ask me to turn up the thermostat. If you are cold, you must do something about it. So before you ask me to turn up the thermostat, ask yourself, do I have on enough clothes? 
you are walking around in shorts and no shirt, the answer is no. Have I put on more clothes? Do I have a blanket? If you are still cold in the summer in Florida with a sweatshirt and a blanket on in my house, maybe I'll turn it up one degree, maybe. But I need you to do something about it first. If you don't like what's happening, your first thought is not whose fault is this and what do they need to do to fix the discomfort of my life, it's what do I need to do? What choice do I need to make? I'm not being fed enough, preacher. Will you speak longer? I promise you, you don't want that. But are you reading your Bible on Monday through Saturday? We will go after the word of God as much as we possibly can. But if you are growing in your faith, do not expect one meal to satisfy you for the week. You don't live like that. You have to choose. Pastor, I want to save my marriage, but, but my spouse, you're already wrong. When you approach the problem with but them, you're already wrong. It is but me. Pastor, what can I do to fix my finances? What can I do to fix my health? What can I do to fix my relationship? What can I do to find community? Change starts with a choice. You have to understand your responsibility to start and finish the race. You've got to understand your responsibility to be patient while you pursue it. We're going to get into the details of that, of this in a minute, but we said the change you crave is a choice pursued through a partnership between you, God, and people, which means if you're doing your part of it, you got to be patient for the others. I love this. In Acts 9.30, if you fast forward to the, to the end of that part of the story, and we're going to cover the, the part we missed in just a moment, it says that, that they, they, they gathered Saul and they took him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus, his hometown. Here's what's crazy about this. So Saul has this just unreal encounter with the Lord and receives this calling on his life. Then he's sent home. And he stays at home for a decade before we see him leave Tarsus to begin to travel, preach, teach, and plant churches. Just because God called you today doesn't mean you will step into the fullness of your calling tomorrow. It requires patience and time and growth. Paul waited 10 years at home. But what did he keep doing? He kept preaching and teaching. Understand this, and it'll make sense to the person who needs to hear it. The platform you desire should be the platform God has you standing on today. Amen. Not the one he hope, you hope he has you on tomorrow. Paul received this transformational call from the Lord, said, I want change in my life, so I'm going to chase after the change, and I'm going to partner with God and people while doing so, so I'm going to be content where God has me. If he sends me home, where is the hardest place to change your life? At home. If he sends me home, I'm going to preach at home. If he sends me home, I'm going to work at home. I'm not going to wait silently and unhappily for God to give me everything. I'm going to work where he's put me while I wait. <laughs> you're chasing after your marriage. You're waiting for your spouse to choose. You still have work to do. My favorite reminder for a husband who's working on their marriage is you have one thing guaranteed. Tomorrow you will still be a son of God. So what kind of son of God will you be tomorrow? If you will allow God to work on you today, if this marriage is saved, or if it is not, you will still be better tomorrow. <laughs> you will still be closer to the being person that God has called you to be tomorrow. You want your finances to get fixed? Let's get help today. Doesn't mean you're going to pay off $30,000 in credit card debt tomorrow. It might be three years from now. But what God will be able to partner with you to do out of generosity for the next 10 years is going to be worth the three years of patient pursuit. Amen. You want to chase after your calling? Then you got to get into it. I love, we, 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 we enjoy visiting Disney. I know some people are mad at Disney right now. It's fine. We'll talk about that later. We enjoy going. And part of the thing that I love is that we will meet people who are, who are high, high up in the world of Disney employees. You know where most of them started? picking up trash or in the parking lot. They found a place they enjoyed. They committed to it. They were patient in the pursuit. And then they finally reached the place where they wanted to be. God will do what God will do. 
Change starts with a choice. You have to choose to pursue this. You have to choose to chase after this. Change starts with a choice, but then understand you can't change alone. Change can't be done alone. The change you crave is a choice pursued through partnership between you, God, and people. You have to choose to start the journey and finish it, but you need help along the way. So we need to understand our help. We need to understand our need for help. I was a mover in college, and I don't say that so that you can ask me to help you move, okay? (laughs) I will give you my price, and maybe or not, you'll say yes. I was a mover for two years in college, and I actually enjoyed the job. But I worked with some really strong dudes. And I remember one guy's name was Clay. Didn't have many teeth, but that's okay. We loved Clay. Clay was awesome. And Clay was just a, a big muscle of a guy. Clay, we would be getting stuff off of a truck, and we'd have a flatbed with these crates. And Clay would just deadlift a washer, just walk off the truck, and then carry it into the house. So when you're a young bull college kid and you're around all these broke down, strong, grown men, the last thing you're going to do is ask for help, right? (laughs) So I'm watching Clay just day after day pick up these washer and dryers and just walk them off a truck. And I thought, I got you, Clay. (laughs) Watch out. (laughs) I go to pick up a dryer because they're lighter. (laughs) You start, baby steps, okay? I go to pick up this dryer and I go to take a step back. What I didn't realize is that the ramp was off centered. So when I took to take a step back, there was nothing behind me to catch me except for the concrete four feet below me. (laughs) I learned very quickly that there are a lot of things that you should not try to do alone. (laughs) Church changes one. You need people to help you change. You need help in your life to see the change you crave. The change you crave is a choice pursued through a partnership between you, God, and people. You need to understand the role of community in the change you desire. Sometimes community is there to support you. Sometimes it's there to keep you accountable. It's there to encourage you. Think about Paul. From the moment Paul had that encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, he needed help. From at the very beginning, the people he was with helped him up. He got up on his own. They took his hand and led him to Damascus. While he was in Damascus, he waited for a man he didn't know to come and pray over him to receive his sight. And then what I love is right after that, it says that then he stayed with the believers in Damascus. Can we think about how insane that is? Like, like in all reality, can we like, let's get uncomfortably honest about what that would look like. That, that honestly would have looked like in 2003, Bin Laden coming to Bradenton, Florida and the bridge church, putting him up in a home. Let's get real. Is it not the same thing? This is exactly what happened. And they said, brother, we will help you. The people who he came to arrest gave him comfort in a home. They took him in to help him. Change can't be done alone. The role of community is so vital. He stayed with the believers. Then the people he went with wanted to kill him, so the believers snuck him out of town. They put him in a basket, lowered him over the wall, and he left town. When he went to the next town, the disciples were a little nervous to receive him saw this man come into town. We hear he's trying to change. We hear he's had an encounter with the Lord, but we know his past. And then one man spoke up. His name was Barnabas. He spoke up on Paul's behalf. And then we see the same thing happen. The disciples receive him. They take care of him. And then when his life comes under threat again is when they send him home and he stays home for a decade before he goes on the full call of his life. Sometimes It just takes one person to believe change in your life is possible for you to change the world. It took one person named Barnabas. Of all the goofy names possible, if your name is Barnabas, I love you, I'm sorry. 
Not Peter the rock, like, no, Barnabas. For Barnabas to stand up and say, "Uh uh-uh, I don't care about his past. We believe in what God can do, so let's help him see what God can do in his life. And he stood up for Paul, and what do you know? Now we study the holy words that the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write. Paul, on his own, took on the entire breadth of the Mediterranean communities, planting churches and preaching the gospel. And one man believed in him, enough to bring him into their community. You cannot change alone. You need someone to believe in you, and someone needs you to believe in them. Just because you haven't had the power to change, don't assume that they won't have the power to change. (laughs) Be the support for them that maybe you never had. Because we cannot change alone. Sometimes we need that encouragement. We need that accountability. Sometimes we need those people close enough to tell us that there is a change we need to make. Does anybody have that person in their life? So my wife was that to me a few years ago. She always is that to me, but it was really hurtful a few years ago in a good way. So there was a couple times that that she had shrunk some really nice shirts of mine. And no, that was the bad thing. Um, and then, so then I went through the season of life, um, and, and I noticed that all my shirts were shorter. So we're like, like, I raised my hand, you could see my belly. And again, the desires of a six pack have not taken place in my life, so there's no desire for me to show anything on me. It's all hidden, hidden under layers, okay? And so I go up to her, I'm like, babe, are you, are you shrinking my shirts again? <laughs> She's like, babe, I'm not, I'm not drying your shirts. You've told me not to. I'm not drying your shirts. I'm like, but I, I hear you. <laughs> However, all my shirts are getting shorter. I'm like, look. <laughs> and she says, babe, I love you. But have you considered that maybe your shirts aren't getting shorter? <laughs> but your stomach's getting bigger? <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. She was enough in my life and close enough in my life to help me see a change that I would benefit from and loving enough to tell me I needed to change it. And 10 years later, I'm almost there. I'm this close. Like, you know, it's like (laughs) the 10 year journey of a pound away. I just bought bigger shirts. It was fine. But (laughs) that's the power of community and the consent of change. You need, you cannot change alone. The change you crave is a choice pursued through a partnership between you, God, and people. We see it with people, but we also need to see it with God. You have to understand your role in the change you want, the role of community in the change you want, and the role of God in the change you want. Part of God's role is to guide and change your heart concerning your life and what's going on. Here's what I love about this verse, and we're going we're to start to close here. In Psalm 37, when we read it in its fullness, <laughs> he says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desire. If your delight is in the Lord, then most likely, what's your heart's desire? The Lord. <laughs> like, do you see how this flows? He says, part of God's pursuit and part of God's role in the change we want to see is to convince, convict, and conform the desire to what he desires for us. Because he knows best. No one knows better as to why you exist than the person who created you. (laughs) Why question the creator on the existence of his creation? It makes no sense. Take delight in the Lord, and he will grant you the desires of your heart. If the Lord is our delight, then he is our desire. Part of his role is to help transform that. Paul's role and Paul's desire went from erasing the name of Jesus to embracing the love of Jesus. It went from persecuting him to pursuing him. That encounter with God and his choice to get up 
to go to Damascus and to wait for help to change his purpose and mission in which he was going there made it possible for him to experience the change he wanted. The change you crave is a choice pursued through a partnership between you, God, and people. The thing that I think God stuck it most in my heart this week was this. Four and five, he says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust in him and he will help you. The, the promise we have, that promise of Jehovah Jireh, the, the provider that the Lord will provide is, is such. He will provide for our needs. He will provide for us every step along the journey. Where we get messed up. And what the Lord convicted my heart about this week with that passage is that we get very caught up on the things we think we need from God. And where I think we get so hung up on change is that it's not that we need more from God, it's that we need more of God. It's not that we need more income from him, we need more of him to give us the wisdom of our finances. It's not that we need God to heal and fix our spouse, it's that we need more of him in our life and in our marriage. We need not just things from him, we need him. This is why Paul says, one of our favorite verses to quote, for I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But just before that, he says that I have learned to be content with nothing and with everything. Why? Because I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Which means I'm okay if I have nothing because I have what I need. I'm okay if I have everything because I have what I need. Because it's not the everything I need, it's the provider of the provision. This morning, I don't think you need more from God yet. You need more of God first. He says, take the light in the Lord. That's more of God. And he will grant you the desires of your heart. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him with everything. And he will give you help. Church, what is the change you crave in your life this morning? What is the change you crave to happen in your life? Have you taken a step to say yes towards the pursuit? And have you committed that thing to the Lord? If not, that's your starting place. It's not even asking for a new job yet. It's committing whatever is uncomfortable and, 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 and discontent in your life about your job, you commit that to the Lord first. Then he'll tell you if you need a heart change about your job or a new job. Amen. In your marriage, you give him the discontent of the health of your marriage. And then he'll show you what you need to do to change it. And then you pray that the Lord puts the same passion in your spouse's heart because it takes two to tango. Amen. Both have to say yes to this pursuit. But your choice is first not theirs because you are responsible for you first you have to choose salvation Jesus already chose you on the cross delight in the Lord he will grant you the desires of your heart the change you crave is a choice pursued through a partnership between you God and people we're going to bring the lights down. We're going to worship just, just for a minute. But I'm going to ask this. If there is a change you crave and you'd be willing to, if you'd stand, and I just want to pray over you this morning. If there's a change you crave and you're listening to the message saying, I understand that the first thing I have to do is commit to pursuing this through the end and committing it to the Lord, then you stand. I'm going to pray for you. I'm, I'm standing too, okay? I got a few. I'm going to put some arms and legs up. <laughs> like. I'm going to pray over you. And, and what, my, what my ask is, is this, is, as the worship team comes up, is as you sing this, this, this hook of run to the Father, that those lyrics is the cry of your heart, saying, I will commit everything to the Lord, and I will trust him, and then I will receive his help. He will not help you with what you do not trust him with. He's not a forceful God. He's a faithful God. 
change you crave is a choice pursued through a partnership between you, God, and people. Father, I thank you for those who are willing to stand and say, there is a change I crave. There is a change I want to chase after. So I will do what's necessary. I will make that choice and I will take that step. And most importantly, I will trust you with it. I will trust you with every step of it. I will trust you with the pursuit of it. I will trust you with the outcome of it. But I am taking ownership of the change I desire, Lord Jesus, not because I can do it alone, but because I have to choose for myself to start the journey. No one can choose salvation for me. No one can choose transformation for me. I have to take the first step. I pray you would receive that step of theirs in faith and that you would help them this morning as they worship to feel the confidence of your presence with them, knowing that they can't do it alone and they will not have to do it alone. Because change is a choice that they make, but it is pursued through the partnership of you, them, and others. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we give you everything this morning. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us today. And if our ministry has been a source of encouragement for you, let me encourage you to do two things. Number one, share it with a friend who needs hope. That would make a big difference in their life. Secondly, share it with us. We would love to hear your story. You can send us an email at amen at bridgechurchfl.com. And finally, if you'd like to partner with us financially as we bring hope both locally and around the world, you can do that directly through our website, bridgechurchfl.com forward slash give. And thank you for letting us be a part of your spiritual journey.